Imagine waking up Christmas morning. It is a beautiful day. You serve pancakes and hash browns to your kids. Your whole entire house is decorated in the Christmas spirit. You watch your babies run downstairs and open up their gifts. You have the best day and a wonderful dinner with your friends. You put your kids to bed only to wake up the next day and realize that you will never see one of your kids again. In today's video, we are going to be talking about the very famous, highly requested John Benet Ramsey case. Before we get into it, though, I do want to let you guys know that this video is for entertainment purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comments section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance on hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, Y'all already know, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. So in today's video, we are gonna be talking about the very, very, very highly requested John Bonet Ramsey case. You guys have requested this everywhere. Y'all are up in my DMs on Instagram, down in the comment section. Even my Patreons have been asking me to do this video. I really went back and forth because I feel like it's been done a million times. If you guys don't know, the John Bonet Ramsey case is like over 20 years old now. It has been a mystery for a long time. However, I do think I know who killed John Bonet Ramsey. We're going to get into that. I'm sure you guys know the story. I am going to tell the story, not with every single detail, because like I said, I'm sure you guys know. And then I want to go over some weird things, some things that I'm suspicious of. We're going to dissect some stuff, and then I'm going to tell you guys exactly who I think did it. And I do think I know who did it, because I'm a detective, obviously. I know everything. <laughs> If you guys don't already know me though, hi, my name is Christina. I do have a second channel, which is Casually Christina. We do things more casually over there. I also have a Patreon. My Patreon is for 18 and up. It's more personal, more personal story times. We go live. It is a good time if you're 18 and up and you'd like to join. We also have a podcast with new podcast episodes coming soon. You guys hang tight. I also have an Instagram if you want to keep up with my shenanigans on a daily basis enter at your own risk and all of those are always linked down in the description box if you'd like to come and check me out so john benet ramsey if you guys don't know the beautiful little six-year-old who was brutally murdered in her own home back in 1996 so let's just start from the beginning real quick like and refresh you guys on the story in 1996 in a small town in boulder colorado now this town was like i think they said 25 miles every which way very small it was described by people as like a town of fantasy like everything was beautiful and well put together and everybody kind of knew everybody type of thing it was not a place where people expected to see evil as a matter of fact, the crime rate was really, really, really low there, and everybody talked to everybody there. In Boulder, Colorado, a family named the Ramses had a home there. Now, when I say a home, y'all, baby, they had a mansion, in my personal opinion. I don't know what y'all consider a mansion, but to me, is a mansion. In the Ramses family, you have the father, who is John Ramsey. You have the mother, Patsy Ramsey. You have the older brother, who at this time was nine years old, Burke Ramsey, and then the baby girl, Jean Benet Ramsey, who was actually named after her father. His name was John Ramsey, and she named uh, they named her Jean Benet. And I think that's so unique and so beautiful. And Jean Benet Ramsey was six years old at the time. Now, the personalities of the family, the father, John Ramsey, was a very well known, well to do, as you guys would say what we call around here rich uh, or wealthy man. He was a CEO of a pretty large company. And it was also said that he actually even had his own little small business. But when I say small business, this small business had its own private jet. He wasn't playing around, okay? He made 
quite a bit of money. His wife, Patsy Ramsey, was really, really known in the town. Like she would do like all these skits and plays and was just very poised and well put together. Loved to decorate. As a matter of fact, in their home, she would decorate the whole entire home for Christmas and let the neighbors like walk through and do a tour in their winter wonderland of the home. And you guys, when I say this was a family of four, okay, a mother, a father, two small children, nine and six years old, and they lived in a fifth room house. It was over 7,200 square foot. <laughs> Whoa, that's like seven of my homes, okay? Five big bedrooms, six and a half bathrooms, and the whole, it was four stories. It had the, well, what they considered the third floor, which was basically like a whole entire apartment, which was the Mr. and Mr. Ramsey's bedroom. Humongous was the whole entire third floor. And then you had the second floor. The second floor was where the kids had their bedrooms. And you had the first floor, which was like the big old kitchen, the living rooms, all of that good jazz. And then the very, very, very bottom floor was the basement. And the basement was like as big as a house. It wasn't like a basement room. It was like a whole nother apartment basically down there. So there was four stories humongous house and she would decorate the whole entire house for Christmas Christmas trees in every single room goals you know just beautiful inside and out now little Burke who was nine years old at the time was described as like a quiet shy kid kind of stayed to himself and then you had Jean Benet now Jean Benet was the princess. She did like all of these beauty pageants. And you guys, when I say she did beauty pageants, she was dressed to a T. She was basically her mom. She was just like her mom, outgoing, loved to perform, beautiful. Now it was said that the father, John Ramsey actually felt a little unsettled and uncomfortable at these pageants that he thought that like, you know, they were dressing the girls up a little bit too much, but nevertheless, his wife was in pageants when she was younger and she loved dressing her daughter up and doing this with her, especially since, you know, Burke was like kind of the shy and quiet one. So Patsy got to really just like have her girl time with her baby girl, Jean Bonnet. Now that I have refreshed y'all on who the family is, let's talk about what happened. So in 1996, on Christmas morning. It started off just like every other Christmas morning for the Ramses. Like I said, they had their house completely decked out with fa -la, -la, la las right? And the kids woke up, they ran downstairs to see what their presents got. You could just imagine, you know, in this family, they probably ran downstairs, they saw the gifts everywhere. Every single Christmas morning, Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey had a tradition where they made pancakes and hash brown and so they made breakfast they ate breakfast they opened gifts and then later on that day they left their home in order to go to their friend's house and they had christmas dinner over there and they celebrated there now the ramses said that on their way home from christmas dinner on christmas evening the kids were you know in the back seat of the car and little jean benet who had had a very full day fell asleep in the car on the way home they said that they got home the three of them patsy john and burke walked inside and then one of them was carrying Jean Benet. They took her upstairs into her bedroom on the second floor, put her in bed so she could go to sleep. And then they hung out for a little bit. Later on, Burke went to bed and then Patsy and John went to bed as well. The next morning, the day after Christmas, which was December 26th, 1996, Patsy wakes up from her third slash fourth floor of the home walks down the spiral staircase to go to the kitchen to make coffee about 5 a.m. And on the bottom of the staircase, she notices these papers. She picks the papers up and the very first line started off with the words, Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign fraction. We represent your business. We respect your business, but not the... I cannot read that word, that it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed. And if you want to see her, 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. You will withdraw $118,000 from your bank account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills and the remaining $18,000 will be in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size. And then the note goes on and on and on. So the ransom note was two and a half pages, three pages long. 
Of course, Patsy freaks out. She sees the note. She is completely frantic. She sees that her daughter is gone. She wakes up her husband and they call 911. Here's part of the 911 call right here. We are kidnapping. Hurry, right, please. Explain to me what's going on. Are you kidnapping? I am the mother. Oh my God. Please. I'm okay. I'm sending an officer over, okay? Please. Do you know how long she's been gone? No, I don't. Please, we just got out and she's right here. Oh my God, please. So of course she's upset. The whole entire family's upset. They say that two minutes after she got off the phone with 911, she called her friends in the neighborhood. Like, remember, you guys, she used to do like tours of her house for Christmas. I mean, she let the neighbors walk all up in her house, touring, looking at Christmas decorations, small town, everybody knew everybody. So she calls her friends over like, listen, John bonnet has been kidnapped. We need you guys here so we can search, have a search party, whatever. So now her house is filled with her friends and her neighbors. The next thing you know, the police show up. The police do a quick swift search. They're sitting around waiting. Now in the ransom note, it said that they were going to call back the ransom people. The small group of individuals was going to call back later that day between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. So they had a two hour window that allegedly these kidnappers, these ransom note, this small fraction or whoever they were, the group of individuals was going to call back at the house, tell the Ramseys where to drop the money. And then they were going to give them their daughter back. However, while the cops were sitting there waiting and all the neighbors, the call never came to, to drop the money or, or find out where they were going to drop the money. So around 1 PM, the cop or the investigator that was at their house said, Hey, listen, it's one o'clock. Like, why don't you just walk around and search the house and see if you see anything that's missing out of place. If anybody's taken anything, anything that we can use as evidence. Yes, I know this is already y'all are like, what? We'll get there at the end. So when the cop tells them to do that, Mr. Ramsey and one of his friends, they decide they're going to start at the basement, right? They're going to start from the bottom to the top. And Mr. Ramsey goes down into the basement and everybody hears a scream. And the scream was Mr. Ramsey saying, my baby. And then he comes up the stairs carrying his little six-year-old baby girl in his arms. And when he made it up the stairs, an investigator met him, this female investigator. And I see John Ramsey carrying John Bonet up the last three steps and um, and my mind exploded. I ordered him to put John Bonet down and he asked if she was dead and I said yes she's dead. Now this investigator has given interviews since then and she said that she saw something strange in Mr. Ramsey's eyes that she will never forget. She said as a matter of fact after she made that eye contact with him which she called nonverbal communication she said that she made sure she had her peace holstered to her side because she really felt like they may not all make it out of that house alive. She was very unsettled by the look that she saw in Mr. Ramsey's eyes. So here we are at this point. You guys know the story. You guys know what happened that day and how they ended up finding John Bonet. Now let's talk about some details of the crime scene. The part that I forgot to mention earlier is that when Patsy found the ransom note and she called her friends over, while they were all sitting there waiting for the cops to come, they were passing the ransom note around reading it. Okay. So everybody's getting their fingerprints and stuff all over this ransom note. Come to find out later that that actual ransom note had been written on one of Patsy's pads that she had right there in her house and probably with one of Patsy's pins as well. They also noticed within the pad that this was like the second time that somebody had tried to write this note. So basically somebody tried to write the note on Patsy's pad, figured it didn't work, tore it off and then wrote it again with her own pad in their own home. Now down in the basement with the crime scene with little Jean Bonnet, and I will tell you guys that if you do Google Jean Bonnet crime scene photos, you can pretty much see everything and it's actually some of it's really hard to see. I am not going to include pictures of Jean Bonnet in here because it's just, I'm just not going to do it. But if you are inclined to see you can. They found that there was a window down in the basement that kind of, you know, you know how like the basement windows, they, they're usually ground level. It was broken and there was a, there was a suitcase that was sitting near the window. Inside of that suitcase was a 
encrusted blanket in a Dr. Seuss book. Now, that was tested and later to find out that the bodily fluids that was on that blanket did match up with John Ramsey's older son that was from a previous marriage. However, they did find out that John Ramsey's older son that was from a previous marriage could not have been down in the basement at the time that John Bonet was taken. He was excluded from the investigation. So it must have been a different time that he was down there with the blanket and the suitcase and all of that stuff. Now, the window that was broken and the footprint, the window had a spider web that was untouched that was by it. That investigators thought, well, a murderer or a kidnapper could not have went in and out of that window because of where the spider web was placed because it was untouched. And then they also said that the snow, there was fresh snow that day. There was no footprints in the snow, meaning that like whoever was down there in the basement with Jean Benet did not go out of that window and walk in the snow they must have either still been in the house or went out of a different exit somewhere. We're gonna get more to that later. I just wanna lay all these things down for you guys first. The autopsy showed that John Bonet actually died from ex strangulation. She had this like cord that was wrapped around her neck and on that cord there was like hair all around it and everything. The end of it was part of a paintbrush that was attached to it and that paintbrush actually came out of Patsy's art kit. So it was her art kit too that was involved in this some way somehow. Little Jean Benet Ramsey during the autopsy was also found to have had a big blunt trauma to her head. Her skull was completely fractured like somebody had hit her in the head with something really, really, really hard. Later on, investigators did find a black flashlight, like one of them big heavy duty flashlights. It reminds me of the police flashlight. You know, them big, them clobber flashlights, right? The big heavy ones. And the Ramsey said that that wasn't their flashlight. They had no idea how that had gotten in their house. John Bonet's mouth was also covered with duct tape. And on the duct tape was red fibers from a jacket or a sweater or a clothing item that Patsy Ramsey had had. Now, investigators did say that she lived in that house. It could have very well been on the duct tape any other way, but it was a little strange. And also little Jean Bonnet's hands and feet were bound as well. And she had some sort of like thing that was wrapped around her tummy. Now this is another really hard part to talk about. And I literally can, I hate saying these things, but I think that it's very important to add to this case is that there was DNA found that was unmatched to anybody's in the house in Jean Bonnet's underwear. But, however, there was no male bodily fluids down there. So a lot, a lot of speculation started going around that little John Bonet, whoever it was, could have, you know, been somebody that wanted to touch her in that way, that maybe it was a pedophile or a child, you know, <sighs> that type of thing. Now that you guys know about that part, there has been a lot of theories that's gone around. One of the main theories that went around was that the brother Burke did it. Now there's a couple of reasons why people thought the brother Burke did it. One reason was when they did the autopsy, they found pineapple in little baby girl's tummy, in John Bonet's tummy. And the mom and dad said that she fell asleep on the way home and they put her straight to bed. There was no way that she should have had pineapple in her stomach, but they did find in the kitchen there was a bowl of pineapple and milk and i guess that they eat the pineapple and milk like that there and that on that was the fingerprints of patsy and burke so there was like this theory going around that jean benet woke up she come downstairs you know they're sitting there eating the pineapple and milk john benet grabs a piece her brother gets mad grabs that flashlight clocks her on the head the family freaks out and then they stage everything in order to protect their son another theory of this situation and, and part of that also is they interviewed burke when he was younger and his interview went something like this He said that after school, there's always needy people waiting there going, Hello, hello, uh, did you see Burke in class today? <laughs> uh, no, I did not. I think he was absent. Huh. Oh, thanks. Huh. <laughs> go. So do you feel like you're pretty safe? Yeah. Yeah? Do you ever worry about it? Not really. No? I'm just, just playing my Nintendo. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about for you and your parents? Okay. Mm -hmm. My parents are sometimes crying. Yeah. But I'm, I'm basically just going on with my life.
What do you think happened? I know what happened. <laughs> I mean, when she got killed. How do you think that happened? Um, you think? Well, I, I, I asked my dad where did they find her body, and my dad, my dad said I found it down in the basement, and so I, I, I think that someone took her very quietly and mm -hmm. took her down the basement, mm -hmm. and then maybe took a knife out, and went, you know, or something mm -hmm. like that. So people thought that was strange the way he was reacting as a little nine-year-old child, but we're going to get to more of that later. Okay. Also, Burke did do an interview with Dr. Phil. Now I cannot put Dr. Phil's videos in my videos because Dr. Phil's team does not play, honey. They be claiming left and right, but I will leave it linked down below. But during the interview, which was the only interview that Burke has ever done, and he did it as an adult and is alleged that he was paid also to do that interview but I mean I don't know I anyways when he did the interview he was smiling like really awkwardly while he was talking and a lot of people thought that like why would he be smiling while he's talking about his sister's you know murder and all of that and we will get more to that later so those are reasons why people were really thinking that Burke did it the other theories was that the father did it that John Ramsey had possibly been doing things that were inappropriate for a while and that he had just snapped one night and he tried to set it up and you know make the scene look like this and also Mr. Ramsey had did some kind of weird stuff too afterwards where you know people were just kind of thinking like he looked weird or they were you know very hush hush and so he became a prime suspect in the court of public opinion as well and then also Patsy Patsy was also kind of blamed too one of them being because she did this interview with CNN right after her daughter's murder and she looked kind of like and what we want to let everyone know. Drugged up or maybe like a little dopey, but you know, to me, when I saw that, I thought like, you know, your daughter was, you just literally just saw your daughter's dead body. Like she's probably on some medication, anxiety, whatever. I mean, I just couldn't imagine like you literally will have to carry me out in a straight jacket if anything happens to my kids. So I, I can't judge her by no means, but people found that weird. Some other strange things about the case was that the Ramseys immediately lawyered up after this. Like they immediately lawyered up and they refused to do quite a bit of like interviews with the cops and they were doing public interviews. Now they said that they were doing public interviews because they wanted to warn the public that there was actually a murderer out there and that he was sneaking into people's houses. And I find if that to be true, very, very noble and a hard thing to do at the time. However, there were rumors going that they didn't, you know, they didn't want to be investigated. And when they asked Mr. Ramsey if he would take a lie detector test, he said he was offended and he would be a very offended if he had to take a lie detector test. With that being said, I can kind of, I don't know necessarily being offended. I feel like I would be trying to do anything I could to help. However, me personally, with the way my anxiety works, even the thought of taking a lie detector test freaks me out. I feel like if they asked me if my name was Christina Randall, I would fail it because I'd be so nervous, you know? So, and that's a scary thing, you know? Because if it's wrong or if a lie detector test is wrong, it can really like ruin and destroy your whole entire life. So you're putting your life in the hands of a machine. So, I mean, I kind of get it, but then again, you know, you just don't know. What do you guys think about that? Another weird thing about the case was that the DNA that was found in John Bonet's underwear. There was part of the investigators that were saying that, oh, that DNA, you know, probably came from like a factory and, you know, wherever it was made and that DNA came from there. And I'm thinking like, if that's the case, like that, that sounds crazy. Like DNA from a factory. Like, is that even possible? You guys let me know down below. And if it is, that's kind of scary to think about, you know, like if people work in a factory, right? And they help make something and then there's a crime later that they could be roped into something, but really they just, I don't know. That sounds a little weird to me and I've never heard that before. Another weird thing about the case was that the father, uh, just a couple days after her murder, they said that they were planning, they were trying to get on a plane or they did get on a plane and were trying to head back to Atlanta. They were from Atlanta, Georgia. And the public was just thought that that was so nuts. Like, why would you leave? He said, 
said because that was their home. They had, I guess they had a home there as well. And that, you know, the crime scene was their house. First of all, their daughter had just been murdered in their home. Second of all, like they had cops and investigators, like, you know, probably fingerprint powder everywhere. They didn't want to stay there. They wanted to go to their other home. Another weird thing about the case was, remember how I told you guys the ransom note was for $118,000? Well, earlier that exact month, and people are like, okay, $118,000, why not a million dollars, right? They were millionaires. Why not $250,000? Why not, you know, why not a half a million dollars? Why $118,000? Well, John Ramsey had actually gotten a $118,000 bonus from his job earlier that month. And I'm like, baby, where they do that at? Who gets a $118,000 bonus, honey? Oh my gosh, a bonus? People really making money like that? Like, whoo! So, are you guys ready for what I think happened and who exactly I think killed Jean Benet Ramsey? Now, this case really gave me a headache for the longest of time. And I just want to let you guys know right now that I'm going to say some things in this last ending segment of this video that's going to make some people mad. So just know that I love you. It is going to be out of love, and it's my opinion. And if you're easily offended, just stop the video now because it's coming in a little bit, okay? Like I said, previously this one really gave me a headache, but after doing and diving into the Golden State Killer case, which is this video right here, if you guys have not seen it, go, go watch it. It completely changed my outlook and perspective of the intentions of people that want to hurt others, take advantage of others, four letter R word, others, murder, you know, all of that stuff. Okay. The Golden State Killer did things that nobody had ever seen or thought of before. I personally do not think that John Benet Ramsey was murdered by her father, brother, or mother. I do believe that somebody did the ransom note. And let me tell you guys what I think. I think that they were very open their house was open. They were letting strangers walk all up in their house to do a tour, which, honey, I just can't. Mm -mm. I mean, I get it. This was back in 1996. Things were a lot different then. There was no internet that's in your face telling you guys every crazy thing that people does. You know what I mean? And they came from good backgrounds, John and Patsy. So they're not thinking through what, like our trauma brains, us that's been through crazy stuff. We thinking like, uh-uh, I don't trust you. They didn't think like that because they didn't have those experiences, right? But nevertheless, they're letting people all up in their house, okay? I think that some very sick person got in their house. They lived in a 15 room, 7,200 square foot home with just their family. And then I think there's Melinda, I think there was other people that were there too, but nevertheless, it's like an enormous mansion. Okay. With four stories. You mean to tell me that somebody could not be creeping around in their house probably for days without them even knowing it. There could literally have been a squatter in their basement and they would not even know it because the house is so big. Okay, even my house, it's a three bedroom split floor plan. I'm on one side, my kids are on the other. However, and this was long before I started doing YouTube, I got cameras everywhere on the inside and the outside so I can watch everything at all times, right? But back in 1996, it wasn't like that. So I think somebody knew that they had money Probably saw John Bonet was probably a, a pedo, okay, a chomo, had his sick fantasies or whatever, got in their house, and I think this person creeped around in their house more than just this day. I think he was probably in his office. I think that's how he found out how much he got for, I think it was only one person. I think that that's how he found out how much his bonus was. He's probably looking through papers. I think that's how he got the notepad. I think that's how he had time to write it. I don't think that the killer was actually planning on killing her either. I think that this man snuck in the house because see, that's what the Golden State Killer did. The Golden State Killer would go in people's homes and that was before this. Maybe he got his inspiration from that guy, right? He would go in their homes and scout out their stuff before he actually went back for the crime. And in those homes, the Golden State Killer did, those homes were a lot smaller than the Ramsey's homes. I mean, come on. I think what happened was everybody went to bed that night. I think maybe Jean Benet came down stairs skipping. She fell asleep early, maybe to get something to drink, maybe saw the pineapple, maybe grabbed a bite, right? 
And I think he snatched her right there because you got to think they're on the second floor or the first floor, whichever you want to call it in the kitchen at this point, mom and dad are on the third floor way up there. Okay. And then he can take her one floor down into the basement where nobody can hear her. And I think that he went to go strangle her to keep her quiet, tied her up. I think he was planning on getting the money, okay? Had already written the ransom note and was thinking with the ransom note, if I tell them I'm gonna call between eight and 10, that'll give me enough time to get far away from here before they call 911 if I tell them I'm gonna behead her and all of this stuff, right? Because at 2 a.m. in the morning, on Chris, the day after Christmas morning, before that they found her, the neighbors, the next door neighbors said they heard a little girl scream and that it disturbed the woman so bad that she woke up her husband and they listened. Now they did a reenactment during the investigation and to, you know, and down in the basement, they had somebody scream or whatever and come to find out that down in that basement, you could hear the scream at the neighbor's house, but you couldn't hear it all the way on the top floor in the parent's house. So I think while he put that thing around her, tied her up or whatever, when she screamed, he took whatever he did, knocked her in the head to get her to be quiet. And then that was it. And then I think he still went out that window and it snowed later and new snow went on top of it. And the way that the, the spider web was, first of all, spiders can literally spin a web overnight. It, it happens every single night. It doesn't take days to spin, to do a spider web. There's been times I've walked outside and there's a fresh spider web on my car just from the night before. Anybody else? Is it just me? Also, though, the way the spider web was, it was just in the corner. I mean, I don't know. I think he, I think he went out. And I think that there were so many mess ups in the investigation that he got away with it. And I also think that it became so huge that he probably didn't do it again. He probably would have. He or she, whoever it is. I'm assuming it was a he. Sorry, guys out there if I'm just judging, but that's just that's just in my brain, right? But I think that it got so big that he probably got spooked and didn't do it again. But I do not. And then if you guys don't know, there was actually two different people that came forward and admitted to doing it. I don't really know if I believe that or not, but I think it was some creep that had been watching Jean Bonnet and knew that he could get up in that house and did, and he could have, like I said, he could have been in that house for a week and that family would not have known. Now, back to Burke. I know a lot of people, like they saw the little like interview with Burke and they thought that, man, he's he acts weird, look how he acts. I just wanna say this, that his personality, even on Dr. Phil, it, it reminds me of people or children that I know that are on the spectrum. There are certain personality types that smile and not everybody's on the spectrum that smile when they're nervous and people do that too. But I have, you know, been in, in, in contact and people that I love very, very or a person specifically that I love very, very much that's in our family that is on the spectrum that, you know, if he gets in a certain amount of trouble, like he smiles just like that. And it's not because he thinks it's funny. It's just the way that he reacts. And when I saw the interview and the interrogation, that's what I thought. I saw, I didn't see a killer child. I saw somebody that was very uncomfortable that may not know how to express their emotions in the same way that we do. I also think that's why Patsy and John Ramsey protected little Burke so much. They didn't want to put him in harm's way by having him come out and do interviews and stuff like that. Cause maybe, like I said, his emotions and his reactions aren't like some of ours. A lot of people thought that Patsy wrote that ransom note and all of that. And I don't think so. I just think that they were multimillionaires and that if something did accidentally happen with Burke, they had the money to hire the best lawyers and the best teams to get him off in any way, especially with him being a child. And also with that money and them being able to hire lawyers and protect themselves, it'd be very foolish for one of them to do something to John Bonet and then use all of their own items in their home, like their pads, their pens, you know, fingerprints everywhere. Like, I just think that they would not do that. They had the resources to, you know, not do it. It would be foolish for them to use their own stuff in their own home. So I really do not think that they had anything to do with it. I think especially, especially 
after watching the Golden State Killer. People can do that. People are capable of that. A lot of people were saying, like, who would do that? Who would go into their own home? Who would plan all that out? Well, the Golden State Killer did it and got away with it for 40 years. Okay? Over a hundred houses that man went into. Like, it, it does and it can happen. Now, for the part that I think is really going to make some people mad here, but I got to say it, you guys. I've got to say it, okay? A lot of people were harping on the Ramseys about putting this little girl in these pageants, saying that it is over sexualized for children, and the pageants are da 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 But let me tell you guys something. Y'all don't want to hear this. I love y'all. This is out of love. That's how I feel about TikTok, Instagram, and the internet nowadays. Let me tell you, I, and I love my little babies out there, okay? Although I don't let, although I don't let Jaden, my nine-year-old, free run to YouTube or anything like that. But I get comments all the time from kids. Matter of fact, sometimes I get DMs from kids over on Instagram saying like, Hey, Christina, you know, I'm 10 years old. I love you so much. And... I always think when I see those messages like, well, I love you too. However, like a 10 year old should not have free range to Instagram like that. It's scary. Did you guys watch this video right here? That was on a kid's app, okay? Y'all don't even want me to talk about TikTok because that's a whole video and I'm really gonna lose some subscribers, okay? When I see 10, 11, 12 year old little girls on TikTok singing WAP, okay, where do you think the pedos are going nowadays? Okay, they don't have to sneak into your homes. They don't have to break into your houses. They don't have to scope you out like they used to have to 30 years ago. Now they can just pick up their phone and they can find your children. You guys, we got to do a better job. Okay, we have to do a better job. So I love you guys. Like, but in my personal opinion, friend to friend, and I ain't no perfect parent, just so you guys know, I am not a perfect parent, okay? I'm still just trying to make it just like we all are, but friend to friend, don't just give your little kids phones and the whole entire internet and anybody they want to talk to at their fingertips because there are real scary people out there waiting to prey on your children. So... Anyways, I love you guys. As always, please do not forget to like this video. It's a free way that you can help your girl out. And until next time, I love you guys so, so, so very much. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. Love you guys.